Hi everyone, this is Kevin with Garrison Dental Solutions and let's talk today about the benefits of using a sectional matrix system over a circumferential or Toffelmeyer style matrix band when doing posterior composites. When Garrison got started you know, 27 years ago, posterior composites were really starting to come into their own. Some of the problems with sensitivity and wear rates and stuff for posterior composites, those issues were starting to get resolved and the real problem was achieving a predictable tight contact. Whereas you can get a tight contact with a circumferential band, you can't always get an anatomical tight contact and one that has better hygienic qualities for the patient and longevity for the restoration itself. And the reason for that is oftentimes when using a circumferential band, the contact point is really high up at the marginal ridge like you see circled in the x-ray. That of course creates a very large food trap underneath there which does an open invitation for reoccurrent caries. It's not that the contact isn't tight but it's a point contact at the marginal ridge. This area is subject to fracture, clusal interference, several different issues that will negatively impact the longevity of that restoration. What we're trying to get is to recreate the natural anatomy of the tooth. We want a broad, tight contact area, not a contact point, but a contact area that mimics that natural dentition. By utilization of a sectional system, we can get that. I'm going to walk you through the reasons why. With a sectional matrix system, the first big difference is the use of those separator rings. They're not retainer rings. They're not like rubber dam clamps where all they're doing is holding something in place. They have a function to actually separate the teeth. They're strong spring clips driving in approximately to push those teeth apart to help compensate for the thickness of that matrix band and of course the polymerization shrinkage of the composite itself. With a circumferential band, the only way to compensate for that is to wedge more aggressively. And of course, when you wedge more aggressively, what shape is the wedge? It's a great big triangle. That's why you get the big, great big triangular food traps because you're shoving a wedge in there for separation instead of using another mechanism. The other part of the equation with a sectional matrix system are the bands, where it gets its name from. They're sectional. They don't wrap all the way around the tooth. That allows for independent manipulation of those bands to help achieve, again, better contacts, better anatomy. With an MOD situation like shown on the screen right now, you're trying to burnish that band into contact with both of those adjacent teeth. And the only way to do that is either stretch the metal out or loosen up the matrix band. And of course you loosen the band up and now you're asking for flash on the buccal and lingual. You're just fighting against yourself. So by use of those sectional bands, being able to independently manipulate them, we can get them into the position that is ideal for each of the adjacent teeth. Let's talk about the sectional matrix individual kit components themselves. You may not have this particular version of our sectional matrix systems, but they are uh, generally set up very similarly. You'll have a selection of the separator rings that are designed for specific locations in the mouth. There'll be a selection of wedges. The wedge is still a critical part of the equation, but the purpose for the wedge with a sectional system has changed. A selection of different sizes of the matrix bands themselves. The line here, this first row with the color-coded portion on there, these are non-stick dead soft matrix bands. The plain metal ones in the top of this kit are the same thickness as the dead soft, but they're a different type of metal and they are much stiffer. And we'll talk about what that can do to help you out. Let's first start with the different types of rings. The Garrison system, our different rings are color coded and they follow pretty much the same pattern throughout the various generations of products that we've put out on the market. We have a blue ring where the tip is shorter than the orange ring. The third style of ring is the green wide prep ring. You can see how much wider those tips are. We'll talk about that when we go to the type it out here in just a second about when and where to use that green ring. The rings that you use are your real workhorse rings are going to be the blue and the orange. Sometimes we refer to the blue ring as the universal ring. It fits in a tremendous variety of situations and if you were to only have one garrison ring, you would want the blue one. Getting them seated properly so that they stay in place is critical. The thing that really helps on the garrison rings is you can see, see how the plastic 
wraps around the bottom part of the tip. And that plastic grips down below the infrabulge and keeps the ring in place. The colored portion on top is a soft silicone rubber. That allows the ring to adapt the band to the tooth to cut down on flash. So what we're getting is we're getting separation because this is driving in approximately separating the teeth. We're getting adaptation through the use of the silicone and we're getting retention by the tips. When we're wedging with a sectional matrix system, our objective is not to create a great deal of additional separation. Our objective is to seal the cervical margin of that restoration, to hold that matrix band up against the tooth firmly down below the cervical margin of the prep to prevent any crevicular fluid or blood seepage into the prep and any material leakage out of the prep that's going to cause flash. One question that I get a lot when we talk about wedges is they're color coded and that color does match some of the colors on the ring. So, you know, if I'm using an orange ring, should I use an orange wedge or blue ring, blue wedge? Uh, the answer to that is emphatically no. When you are uh, selecting a wedge, what matters is how it fits in the interproximal space, not what ring you're putting over top of it. You're going to use whatever wedge appropriately fits the interproximal space and then the appropriate ring uh, depending on the type of restoration that you're working on. These particular wedges, the Strategy wedges, they have a very significant hollow area underneath. So that's to sit down over the papilla instead of crushing the papilla down, but to sit over it. And then the, the little fins here on the side to ride down on either side of that, again, for sealing of the band against the tooth. And it, it's a two-part wedge. The, the darker color in the middle, that's a firm plastic. And then the light color on the outside that actually has the little fins on it, that's a soft rubbery material called TPE. And the purpose of that is to improve the adaptation of the wedge to the interproximal space. So if you've got a little root concavity or, or some other type of anatomical irregularity, by having this added bit of flex, by having it not a hard material, it will follow that. And then the little teeth, the little soft fins, once it goes through the interproximal space, they pop back out and it doesn't want to back out then. When we're talking about the matrix bands with a sectional matrix system, it's the same color coding rule that I mentioned about the wedges. They're color coded, that's just to help identify them. It is not indicative of using a blue wedge with a blue band and a blue ring, or a green band, green wedge, green ring. Nope, doesn't matter at all. What matters is selecting a band that most closely approximates the gingival occlusal height of the tooth. You want that top edge, the marginal ridge portion, if you will, of the matrix band to be right at or just a little, maybe half millimeter above the marginal ridge. If you put a band in that's too tall, you'll have a tendency to overfill the restoration and then you have to cut it down and you end up with kind of a blocky marginal ridge instead of a nice rolling marginal ridge. So you want to try to match that up as best you can. It's okay if it's a little tiny bit too tall. It is not okay if it's too short. And as I mentioned and when we started this video, the color-coded ones are dead soft. They're extremely malleable, right? They'll take any shape that you put on them. There's good things and bad things to that, right? It's great if you're wanting to adjust the shape of this a little bit to mirror the anatomical shape that you want to restore. It is a real problem when you go to insert the band and your contact is not broken with the preparation. So if you struggle with getting your band in place, you could take a firm band and you can shove this band down through there without too much trouble. That's great for those situations. But then of course the flip side is this is the shape that you're going to get. If you burnish this band to try to change its shape, it just bounces back. A lot of times that's a good trade-off though, so if that's a struggle that you're having, getting the bands in place, ask them to get you some of these firm bands. Most sectional matrix kits come with their own ring placement forceps. Make sure you're using the forceps that were designed for those rings. Do not use a rubber dam clamp forcep. Overall, there, there's a lot of similarities here, right? But this rubber dam clamp forceps was made to place rubber dam clamps, not rings, and it shows. Your control of that ring is non-existent 
with a rubber dam clamp force set. This makes placing the ring very, very difficult. You need to control that ring. You need to not have it moving around. You need to make sure that it is firmly attached to the forcep so that it, it can't just pop off. And a lot of these rubber dam clamp forceps, the handle portion will hit together before you've got the ring open far enough to put it over a molar. It, it just is a bad choice and will make things so frustrating for you. So just use the correct forceps is probably one of the number one most important things I can tell you today. The forceps for these rings, they have designed notches that, I mean, this ring does not move in here. It allows you to open them far enough. The way that the fulcrum is positioned in here, it makes it easier to open, particularly if you've got smaller hands. Let's put that all together and actually place it on the type of knot. I know this patient pretty well and I know the purple mid-size band works really good on the distal of number 12 here. With the matrix bands, they have a little tab at the top that can be quite convenient for placement. You can just grab that with a cotton forceps. This is a surgical tissue forceps. Some people use a hemostat to place them. Um, some people even use their fingers. It doesn't matter what you use. What matters is do you have the control you need to place that matrix band. These bands have quite a bit of curvature to them. So they you can't just push them straight down into place. You have to roll them around the curve of the tooth. So that's what I'm gonna do here. I've given my band a little bit of a curl, make that easier to place. And then I'm gonna kind of roll that around for placement. And then I can push that tab over the adjacent tooth just like that. If you've got your fingers in there, go ahead and give that matrix band a little bit of a pinch so that you're getting the ends of the band up as close to the tooth as possible. That gets them out of the way for you when you go to place the ring. Right at that marginal ridge, I've tucked the bottom portion of that matrix band down into the sulcus just a tiny little bit. There we go. We're looking pretty good there. Now, when I go to wedge, the question often is, is which direction should I wedge from? Should I wedge from the buckle or the lingual? You wedge from the side with the largest embrasure or potentially where the restoration is tending towards. This one's a little bit towards the lingual, right? And the embrasure on the lingual is also a little bit wider. If you look at the wedge, it's tapered. So we want the fattest part of the wedge and the fattest embrasure to provide the most support down by the gingiva for the matrix band. I'm gonna wedge it from the lingual and I'm going to put a finger on that band. And I'm not being gentle about it. I am holding that band down firmly with pressure because if I don't, I just push the band out of the way. I want the wedge to go all the way through the interproximal space. If you're applying pressure to your wedge and your wedge looks like that and that's as far as you can get it in, that's too big of a wedge. You are not going to be sealing the band up against the tooth on the buckle portion here. The wedge should be holding that band pretty firmly, right? If you, if you were to accidentally hit that, it's not going anywhere because the wedge is holding it in place. We can see we've got that in there very nicely all the way around. We've got it in contact with the band following that emergence profile of the tooth and we're ready to place a ring. Garrison rings should always be gripped on the metal portion, not the plastic portion. Grip them up here on the metal, they're easier to open and less likelihood of cracking that plastic. So when I go to place the ring, generally I'm going to have the loop of the ring towards the anterior. There's enough space in the center of that ring to work. I'm not going to come in and try to drop the ring straight down. What can happen is you can catch the edges of the matrix band and as you, you know, start to move down to put the ring into place, you can actually crush the band or dislodge it. So what I'm gonna do on a DO is I'm gonna come from behind it and into it. See what I'm doing there? Behind it and into the band and then down. 
If I was on the mesial, I'd come from the front and into the band and down. Look around with your mirror. You want to see one end of that wedge right in the middle. The other end of that wedge right in the middle. We've got great placement. We've got fantastic adaptation of the, of the band to the tooth. But we're not quite ready to start etching and bonding. Last thing we want to do is make sure that the matrix band is firmly in contact with the adjacent tooth. So I'm going to come in here with an instrument and all I'm going to do is I'm not burnishing, I'm not scrubbing back and forth. What I want to make sure is at the point of where I want my contact to be, that that is up tight against the adjacent tooth. So I'm just kind of push, 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 right? making sure it's in contact there. You should not see anything but matrix band rolling around and contacting the tooth at the floor of the box. Then you can begin your etching and bonding procedure. What I want to talk about before I let you go here today is when to use the wide prep ring and when not to use it. You use the wide prep ring when the prep extends either uh, to the buckle or the lingual to the point where the regular ring it's just going to collapse into the box. See that? Uh, obviously, that's not going to work. If we had a band in there and I release that, it crushes the band into the box, you have a misshapen restoration. It's not going to work. The wide prep ring is large enough to bridge that gap. That is the only time that you really use the green wide prep ring. Uh, it is not recommended for quote unquote normal size restorations. The reason being is the width of these pads spreads out the force generated by the ring. I'm squeezing more on the sides of this premolar than I am in approximately between the two. So my separation is not as good. And unless I need it, unless I need that added support for something like this really big prep, I don't want to use that ring. I want to stick to my, my, my smaller tips where they push more in approximately and provide more separation. We have many videos out on our YouTube channel that I would encourage you to take a look at for additional tips and tricks.